Game of Thrones. Uh, I am Peter. I say I'm Policy Council at Access. I work on our telecoms advocacy. Uh, we issue policy guidance um, and have been working with a lot of these uh, folks on stage um, for the last couple of years, especially. Um, I think uh, we want to get to a few of the, the bigger um, current events in, in telcos and human rights, um, including transparency reporting um, and reporting more generally. We're going to talk about regulatory restrictions and uh, we're going to talk about the, the human rights approaches and really implementing the um, guiding principles on business and human rights in the telco sector. So I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, on the left, um, we have Eves Nism. Uh, Eves is chair of the Telecommunications Industry Dialogue um, and is also uh, an executive at Orange France Telecom. Um, Ihal Osman is the former CEO of Sudatel and is uh, currently managing partner at Africa TNT Ventures. Larry Stone um, is president of Group Public and Government Affairs at British Telecom. Um, British the longest, the longest title I could get. <laughs> I trust you can, you can expand that. Um, and we have uh, Dalia Hajoma, a Sudanese activist and expert on sanctions. Um, Technology. Uh, to her right, we have Arzu, uh, Azerbaijani blogger and activist. And finally, we have Randy Milch, um, Executive Vice President of Public Policy and General Counsel of Verizon. So you can see we've got some geographical uh, spread on the panel and uh, hopefully some great expertise on, on the various ways that telcos impact human rights. So rather than um, you know, going around giving our uh, top three priorities, let's just get right into the questions. I was hoping Dahlia could kind of frame the discussion here by talking about the ways that um, ICT have both uh, helped human rights causes and campaigns and um, also played a role in, in, in uh, kind of putting an obstacle in the path of, of some of these democracy movements around the world. Okay. Um, so just to give it a little bit of a political context, um, since not much, much, a lot of you may not know Sudan well, um, we've been having a growing uh, protest movement uh, since January of 2011, just like the rest of the region around us. Uh, it may not be covered as extensively by the international media, but it's growing and it's um, it was mainly started by having young activists and student leaders uh, leading it, and of course using technology. Um, we've learned a lot of hard lessons along the way. Um, and uh, from January 2011, there were bigger protests in the summer of 2012, and even bigger protests last September um, that were no longer just led by students in the youth movement. Um, uh, but also very populous uh, with participation that is very diverse, um, not centered just in the capital but around the country. Um, and what, the change in the use and creativity of, uh, um, of ICTs that we're seeing um, is that no longer is it just um, students and the very the upper middle class using the technology, but also people from the periphery using uh, this technology. Uh, in the last protest of uh, uh, September, for instance, we saw that most of the ex uh, graphic pictures of how protesters were being uh, treated in the streets were actually coming from the periphery. Um, a lot of them were um, of young people uh, shot in the head and, and the torso, showing that the government was really intending and intentionally killing the protesters. And it was the very first time in urban centers that Sudanese were uh, uh, experiencing this kind of violence uh, because that part of the country is generally more peaceful and, and the, the wars and the conflicts are usually more remote and not covered by social media. And I think it was the trigger that made the government a little bit panic and, and close the internet and do an internet total shutdown uh, for 24 hours is this excessive use by just normal citizens. Um, and even after that shut, shut down, um, 
happened, people were still trying to communicate with the rest of the world with lesser technologies like SMS. But during this shutdown, some of the SMS technology was also interrupted. Um, after the internet did come back, what, what we were seeing is that because of either intentional, it's difficult to say if it was intentional or if it's just excessive use uh, that led the network to be very slow. People were not anymore able to upload video um, uh, or even use their smartphones uh, to go on social media. So they moved into using things like WhatsApp. Um, and during that time, WhatsApp was instrumental. Everybody was on a WhatsApp group that was very local, community-based, whether it's your family or group of activists. I myself have at least like five or six different net networks of WhatsApp in my, on my phone. And the diaspora uh, was very important during that time. The things that people inside the country were not able to do and they were able to share that information um, via whether it's movies or, uh, or photos or just information, it was being used by the diaspora to be uploaded on social media, uh, YouTube, um, etc. Um, of course, we now know that WhatsApp is being built by Facebook, and there is an internal discussion by users inside Sudan. Kind of the fears are, that I'm hearing so far is like, what happens when we choose to delete all of our information? What will they do with it? Um, uh, how are they storing data, uh, and, and, and for how long? And can we have um, a better picture of things like uh, encryption uh, of the technology? Um, Generally speaking, during that time, there was also information backup for the Sudanese street. Um, uh, satellite TVs were being kicked out of the, the country, the instrumental ones like um, and Anubia and, and, and Sky TV. Uh, newspapers who were writing about the situation were not allowed to um, uh, publish. So uh, the internet was very important for people inside and outside um, to get information. Great, and I think we've seen that um, in, in Venezuela as well, the breakdown of traditional media um, lacking independence. People will look to foreign news media as well as uh, internet-based sources of information. Um, and you know, they're experiencing shutdowns as well as the government I think, realizes that. Ihab, could you talk a little bit um, about that shutdown that Dahlia mentioned um, in September of last year? Uh, from your perspective, uh, which was, as at the time, the head of one of the companies um, who, uh, who shut off internet access um, to users in Sudan. Um, sure. Um, uh, telecom companies and telecom departments, I think, are uh, probably one of the most regulated industries uh, in the world. Uh, if you look at telecom service providers and financial services, probably um, you know a similar level of, of regulations from, from from the governments. So each telecom environment in whatever country, I think, would be an accurate reflection of the level of sophistication of regulation and um, regulatory environment in that particular. Uh, environment or country. And um, so if you have uh, an authoritative regime, uh, regulations will be as such. Uh, if you have more uh, democratic, open societies, uh, regulations will be as such. Even though lately we're finding maybe that's not exactly the case, uh, even here in the US. Um, but in general, so I would say the direct control of government regulations is quite uh, strong in, in telecom services. Because at the end, you are licensed entities, you have to pretty much uh, follow the guidance of those licenses and whatever directions that come from, from the regulators and uh, regulatory bodies. Um, the internet uh, in Sudan, uh, once it was um, cut off. Um, actually, I was here in San Francisco uh, attending Oracle of the World. Uh, and um, when the issues started, so I had to cut off my, my, my business trip and, and fly back to, to Khartoum. 
Um, and um, when I arrived in the uh, early hours of Thursday, which was less than 24 hours after the cutoff, I immediately gave uh, orders to my team to reconnect the service. Um, because it was the right thing to do. Uh, and uh, that did not necessarily sit very well with uh, our regulators. Um, however, as I said, it's, it's um, even from a regulation point of view, it's an extremely gray area uh, because there has to be some lawful um, and legal process into how you would carry something like that. And in that case, I don't think the process was fault, uh, even by our um, regulation standards. Uh, so I think the overall um, cutoff was um, a little under 24 hours. Uh, but as Dalia said, I think uh, since this is so, uh, we are one of two service providers in the country that have access to submarine cables and international bandwidth. Um, our services return a few hours uh, before everybody else, essentially. Other service providers in the country, when they saw that we've connected our services, then they start returning uh, their services as well. Um, but um, it had severe impact on the country uh, in terms of um, on the social media side, but more importantly, even on the business side. Uh, complete stoppage of financial transactions, airlines, I mean, everything. Uh, everything pretty much stopped. So it's uh, probably it is one of those events that will not be happening anytime soon in the country. I think. So we've heard um, a little bit about some of the most extreme uh, disruptions uh, to users' ability to access networks. These full network shutdowns. Um, I wonder if the other telcos on the panel could talk about some of the other human rights challenges that they see um, facing the sector, uh, which may not be kind of as stark or as obvious as, as a member shut down. Yeah, um, well, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Um, it's very difficult to follow that. My main first point was going to be that I, I have no idea what Game of Thrones meant. Until my daughter mentioned that it was linked to Game of Thrones, so I'm, saying that I'm the wrong person for this panel. I think, I think ours do is actually our, our resident Game of Thrones expert. Oh, okay. um, well, what are the issues? I mean, the, the issues are legion. I mean, the, the, um, uh, when I look at the issues, you've got from freedom of expression um, and the right to privacy, and there are about, what, 30 plus uh, human rights, the most salient for the telcos are those, plus uh, right to life. You mentioned the issues about establishment and licensing in the country, so you have a real issue about people. Um, and similarly, um, uh, you know, also the issue about supply chain and relation to labor rights. That's one, that's one bucket of issues. And the next bucket of issues is really privacy and data protection, uh, you know, critical issues for us um, uh, as a service provider. We're a B2B business outside the UK, and we serve consumers, but not mobile inside the UK. Then you get into the whole issue of cyber security, you know, internet governance, and national security. There's, there's a complete continuum. And um, for each of those sub-areas, you have different parts of government dealing with them, and also different parts of civil society dealing with them. So one of the big issues for me is trying to somehow um, put my arms around thing, or the team put their arms around thing, and trying to, to reduce things to something which is manageable and effective, and also is something we can, we can advocate and also speak to our customers about. So it's just the size of things, just trying, just trying to navigate it. So, yeah, I mean, you have talked about regulatory sophistication, Sounds like you're talking about over sophistication, um, almost getting too idiosyncratic um, on the issues that, that you face. Well, I think um, I haven't mentioned telecom regulation yet, uh, which varies still uh, country by country between the US uh, and, and the UK uh, and Europe. Um, I mean, you just look at the issues around access regulation, the issues around uh, net neutrality, um, and the issues around uh, we have codification in the UK of network transparency management and codes of practice. And the European Union is now looking at a, a regulation uh, to make uh, uh, user uh, information more standard and more transparent in relation to internet services, and also to get some basic net neutrality rules in Europe. So there's a, 
We've got this huge horizontal thing, and then lots of stuff happening in the telco set. Okay. Randy? Well, <laughs> it's difficult. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. It's difficult to uh, think of anything Larry didn't cover. Um, thank you. <laughs> very kind. Appreciate it. Uh, I, I agree with all of the, uh, the both the horizontal and the vertical segments that he you know, delineated. I think that obviously all of those issues have been made more difficult on a global basis uh, uh, with you know the events since last June with Mr. Snowden. So I think that those uh, those issues have have uh, have served to uh, raise a series of very legitimate questions uh, among users and civil society participants and governments all around the world. And they've also been uh, susceptible of uh, opportunistic uh, uh, use by uh, companies and governments for uh, aims that I think are probably inconsistent with uh, open society and open internet uh, efforts. So it's, which is just the way the world is, and, it's, uh, and, and it makes it unfortunate and, and difficult to um, to come up with a with a straight path through this thicket. Uh, and so there's a, this this extra this extra confusion that's been wrought. Uh, while it's a very valuable set of discussions that are being had, I believe on the subject of uh, government surveillance around the world, uh, uh, also raise issues and the possibility of a fractured internet and issues of of a loss of internet freedom as, as governments seem to, uh, to uh, balkanize, I guess, for want of a better word, the, the, the internet uh, in a lot of different ways. So I think that that's an added aspect of the, this problem. Uh, Hughes, do you have anything to add to this intervention? Well, from what was said on this, well, we, we've experienced quite a few uh, story not as strong as this one, but uh, in, in most of the country where we operate the one orange, uh, we are in Africa and Middle East. And when the Arab Revolution uh, started, we did experience exactly the same thing. We were forced to do things. Um, I, I often tell the story, I think we can tell now because uh, the government is not in this anymore, uh, which is Egypt in which uh, during the Mubarak time they came to us with, with machine guns and, and asked us to send uh, SMS to all our uh, customers. Uh, we couldn't have you know, no, no possibility. Uh, the only thing we, we could obtain, and that's an important issue because uh, we can still have uh, dialogue and discussion and transparency even though you have a machine gun uh, We asked them to sign the, the messages we were sending. It was not sent on the name of Orange, but it was sent on the name of the other militaries. Um, that was <laughs> difficult. Uh, many other telcos around the world uh, did experience things like that. There are things we don't want to do, but as my neighbor said, the regulation is so strong that uh, most of the time we have our hands are tied to, to the regulation. Basically, uh, you say yes or you disappear from the country, and the license agreement can just Design, a company can be nationalized, it can, can happen, and then the, the safety of your people on the ground is also a very, very important issue. So, yeah. when we experienced that, we decided uh, many telcos together, and like many suppliers, to, to try to work together. I don't know if you want to enter the subject now, but we, we definitely uh, needed to talk to each other to be a leverage all together. Uh, with governments and we created the ID telecom industry dialogue uh, to try to share our experiences, to, 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 to try to be stronger, to try to, to commit on a few things we can do on transparency, to try to, uh, to commit first on some principles. The first issue that we made uh, out of the uh, industry dialogue was to write 10 principles on, on human rights, on freedom of speech and privacy. I'm, I'm going to send you to, to our uh, uh, .org site to, to check them, but basically 80% of them are the same principle as any other company would use. But there are two big differences. And the first one we just talked about was uh, that uh, we are very local. The governments are our uh, stakeholders, and we need to keep on talking to them. And that's a big difference with other companies we don't have. 
local, you know, uh, prints and, and, and local uh, relationship. Uh, we have uh, sometimes, if I take back the, the example of Egypt, we have 6,000 people on the ground. Those 6,000 people are, uh, for 99% of them, are Egyptians. We do have social law, we do have a lot of things around them, and so it's very easy for the government to press on us to, to have us uh, do things. That's a, the first difference, and the second difference, of course, the safety of our people, you know, which is uh, many times uh, the first priority. It, it comes uh, before human rights, basically. And this is what we stick together. We printed our principle uh, a year ago. It exists in many languages, and we are now trying to work all together in this uh, industry dialogue. I would not more to make more questions on that. Thanks. Yeah, the telecom industry dialogue, I think the site is telecomindustrydialogue.org. Um, it's a group of nine operators and vendors uh, who jointly address their privacy and freedom of expression impacts. Um, and uses the chair. Um, I, I, we've talked about um, the industry dialogue's reach around the world and how most of the companies are centered in Europe. Um, there's one U.S. company that's, that's a member. Um, I thought Arzu could talk a little bit about uh, the parent company subsidiary relationships. Um, being in Azerbaijan, uh, she's she's kind of seen how uh, Azerbaijan, um, though it may be. Um, part of a parent company who has laudable human rights goals and standards um, can fall short of, uh, of the commitments of the group for the parent. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's been, when we talk about principles, um, unfortunately, in, I'm sure in, as in, as in many cases of authoritarian states, in Azerbaijan as well, principles don't really work. Um, so you can have many different principles adhering um, to the conventions, but still, um, in particular, in a subjective case, it usually uh, never is successful. And one of the examples is the fact that um, uh, very recently, only about two years ago, we learned that the government uh, very skillfully installed black boxes uh, through one of the main um, telecom operating um, as itself. And it was kind of in partnership with Telesignera, which is a Swedish uh, uh, company that has shares as itself. And with, with those black boxes, it was very easy uh, for the government to uh, get any kind of information about its users, you know, SMS, uh, browsing, uh, phone calls, names, and everything else. And uh, what was really interesting was that um, there was no kind of, uh, you know, apology or, or anything on behalf of the government saying that you know, we're actually surveying over you and we're, we know everything about you. Uh, but uh, another interesting thing was um, the way of the government is actually using um, all of this surveillance and how, how much it refers to the phone companies. And um, we've seen it in protests um, because 2013 has been a year of protests for Azerbaijan, especially. And so um, certain regions that are further outside the capital where the protests have been happening in the past um, year seen a lot of blockage in communications or even internet uh, access would be shut down for, for several hours or 15 hours. Or internet cafes would be raided. Uh, by the government officials trying to find the people um, you know, responsible for sharing the updates uh, from the region. Uh, so it's been very um, uh, challenging to address that because there's no other way and the, the companies are not very dependent. They're not independent at all from the, kind of the spell of the government. And if you compare it to the game... Is it government, government ownership or is it um, it's, it's, governments and it's, it's not clear government ownership, but it is. I mean, it's, it's, it goes as a private company, but the government clearly has um, a lot of control over the main two companies, well, the three companies that we have, uh, as I sell, books out, and as I sell. Okay. And the Game of Thrones uh, time? The Game of the game of Thrones, if, if as a Bajan is the real, uh, then as a Bajan government is, you know, controls the seven kingdoms. <laughs> 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 Peter, can you make this uh, argument, and I've, and I've made it uh, uh, last year in the Stockholm Internet Forum. It, telecom companies, it's of their business interest to have free and unfettered access 
to all of its users. We are in the business of selling bandwidth, selling access, so it is to the telecom companies business advantage to have access as freely available as possible, to have users consume all the bandwidth in the world that they want, to get them. So yeah, this notion that you know telecom companies are in bed with governments is we are not telecom companies don't do this while they're happy about it. It is often the legal framework, it is the, the licenses, it's the regulatory regimes that will force the hands of the telecom companies to take certain acts that is not necessarily in the business interest of telecom companies. So I, 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 I think there is this harsh look at telecom companies that are you know, happily doing this and providing information and, and essentially, because any extra information you provide to government, to, to government agencies, it inhibits uh, you know, users, it inhibits uh, consumption of, of data and, and access, and it puts a cast over it, and this is not good for the business of telecom operators. So it is in the best interest of telecom operators to have as free access as possible. Thank you for that sentiment. I, uh, I think that segues into one of the questions that we have on the Slido board, and uh, I'd like to encourage the audience to use this as well as to uh, use the mic. I think that should be circulating. Um, one difference I see in the telecom sector um, is uh, around heavy users, I think there's been, um, you know, as opposed to like, to the airlines industry or you know, your average coffee shop, uh, where they might encourage heavy use of their services um, and possibly provide freebies to those heavy users. It seems like in the telecom sector, um, a lot of the businesses are taking the opposite approach, where uh, they would actually like to penalize those folks who are making the most use of their um, of their services. Um, I, I think this has come up in the U.S. context most recently with this um, FCC case um, and Verizon and Comcast's um, choice to, to kind of sign directly up with Netflix um, and sort of charge for direct access to its servers. Um, and ET, I saw earlier this year in 2013, uh, for the first time, a lot of unlimited um, use uh, of the networks, and uh, I did want to ask Larry how that um, that new plan, the, the Infinity, I think, plan is uh, is carrying out, and uh, what changes you might see at the European level um, if this telecom single market regulation is passed um, for net neutrality and uh, the rights of users to access all points of the network. In fact, I'm not sure if Infinity was a great branding group, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's certainly better than it used to be. I think the, um, the, 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 the um, uh, super fast or faster broadband in the UK has been a um, uh, uh, feature of two things. One is a massive generational scale investment in optic fiber. So the ability to uh, deliver uh, faster speeds is, is there. Um, I think that's the uh, uh, one key element. And the other, in our case, I think was, was a feature of the success of the competitive regime. So I think one, one thing which is often missed in the net neutrality or open internet debate is the importance of competition. In the UK, we have a very uh, detailed regime called functional separation, which makes sure that the wholesale network is available to all retailers, the same price and terms and conditions, um, and both you know, pricing, behavioral issues, uh, systems issues. And that's you know, published in the report. It's also led to a very verdant um, uh, service provision, retail service provision market. So you have you know, a couple of thousand internet service providers, of which there are about five or six really, really big ones. So that's one element. And there are two other uh, features of, um, of the approach to net neutrality in the UK. One is, um, uh, on top of that, uh, we have a series of, I think, relatively, well, hopefully, world-leading codes of practice um, on a network management transparency. B, broadband speeds, and C, a thing called on, on open internet, which basically means anyone signs up is not going to block uh, access to any site or do any throttling uh, unless that site's uh, demonstrably illegal, you know, child, uh, child porn or something unpleasant like that. So that's 
one set of voluntary codes, and we publish a lot of detail on which is comparable detail on uh, internet services and um, uh, congestion management, etc. And the third element that you mentioned is the European Union law. Um, there's already laws in Slovenia and the Netherlands around net neutrality, but many pros in Brussels have tried to well, let's have an overarching European-wide uh, regime. And there's two things. One is under a thing called the user rights element uh, directive, uh, there's going to be additional uh, information to users, uh, comparable information on um, transparency on um, fixed and mobile internet services. Uh, and secondly, there's going to be, a, um, if it goes through the European Parliament in Strasbourg soon, uh, so if I'm boring people to death, please say, um, there's going to be a, um, uh, there's going to be a um, uh, vote uh, which basically is going to ban um, anti-competitive throttling um, and blocking. Um, and on the other hand, there's going to be a, a, a series of, of terminology about well, what's therefore allowed in terms of sensible network management and also in terms of offering um, specialised services as defined to the OTT players on a commercial basis, that sort of thing. Um, Randy, yeah, there's a question here. Um, I'd love you to respond to Larry um, and give your take on the net neutrality and how Europe's uh, theatre might affect the US. But we also have a question here whether sponsored data plans uh, where content providers pay for their content not to count against user data caps violate the spirit of net neutrality. <clears throat> Thanks, Peter. Um, so let me go back to some, some of the earlier parts. Uh, certainly Larry gave a, a great view of what's going on in the EU. Uh, so I'll try to take a few of the issues that, that I discussed. First, um, the, the question is raised generally about the potential for uh, a, a double-sided aspect to the to internet to internet service provider content delivery. Um, uh, you know, we, we are strong believers that uh, it's a mistake to upfront decide that a whole series of business models shouldn't be explored, may have no potential benefit for anyone, uh, and the like. Which was which is sort of the um, uh, unfortunately somewhat of the knee-jerk reaction when you have ex-ante regulation. In space where you haven't had any actual business experimentation. Um, so I think that we're, um, we're eager to look, we're eager looking forward to seeing if there are beneficial um, uh, arrangements that can be made uh, along these lines. I don't believe that a sponsored data plan, which Verizon doesn't have any of, excuse me for putting the preposition at the end, um, doesn't have any of those yet, um, uh, does not violate uh, the spirit of net neutrality. I think that the, the spirit of net neutrality is essentially uh, making sure that your customers can go where they want to go on the internet, um, and uh, which you know, I, 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 I agree with you, Hob, that's our business. We have no percentage in blocking, we have no percentage in slowing people down to go to, to other to, 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 uh, services and the like, and so I think that um, you know we're eager to to uh, have our customers have the best possible internet experience because they can go everywhere we provide fiber, which is past 18 million homes, which we spent tens and tens of billions of dollars putting in. You know, we want people to use it. We want people to be happy using it. We want as many people as possible using it. If they don't like us, they're going to go somewhere else. So um, uh, we have a very real competitive interest in, in making sure that our, our users have the best uh, internet experience possible, both landline and in wireless. Right, we have the same issue on the wireless front, where you know 100 million people have decided that they like our service and they can switch with it. So the uh, the question then becomes, uh, okay, what what will be permissible? What will what will arise that is of interest to all of our customers? That is of interest to content providers? And I don't know the answer to that yet. I haven't seen the market develop. I think that we're going to be very conscious of the possibility that customers might be unhappy. That would not be good for us. So we're going to be very conscious of that, of that aspect to it. Um, I, I do also want to say that um, there's a lot of confusion in my mind, I believe, about uh, the announcement that Comcast made about a deal with Netflix. Um, we don't have a deal with Netflix. Uh, we'd like to have a deal with Netflix, but we don't have one yet. Um, uh, I think it's a mistake to conflate those uh, arrangements, whatever the Comcast arrangement is, and no one has any idea what it is because it's, it's, it, they didn't really disclose it, um, with the issues that surrounded the net neutrality decision that recently came out. They are not, they are in different 
camps. They are not the same issue. Uh, they are a very different issue. One issue is an issue of uh, congestion at peering points, which is was it, which is, it was explicitly excluded from the FCC's net neutrality rules um, as they as they as they existed. So uh, that this is a very different issue about <coughs> recognizing that uh, video flows over the internet have hugely eclipsed traditional traffic flows over those peering points. And you have a very real question about what's, which set of shareholders is going to invest in changing those, the, the, uh, you know, change, putting in the hardware on those peering points. Now, we obviously have an interest in making sure our customers have, our end user customers, our FIOS customers, our DSL customers have the best Netflix experience possible. Because if they do, they're going to want to keep on using it, and that's good for us. Uh, Netflix has that same interest. Netflix has intermediaries that it drops the traffic off to, but come to us. So if we have traditional arrangements with those intermediaries that have been eclipsed by the flow of traffic, and whatever, by the way, commercial arrangement that a content provider and its intermediary have already, whatever arrangement that that may have been, which we're not privy to, that led to all that traffic going that direction, um, you know, these things have to be regularized. And that I think that we have in good faith um, initiated discussions with Netflix and with many other content providers to try to come up with arrangements so that we can uh, efficiently get their traffic uh, onto, our, onto our network so that we can get it to our end users. Um, and so questions about who pays for that are commercial arrangements that we have worked out with many content providers and we're confident we're working out with the rest of the content providers as we go along. I actually have a question, a personal question for the telecom reps who are working in countries that are less free and authoritarian regime. The point that urges you about that you may have regulations that look beautiful on paper or principles, but the, the challenge of actual implementation is the issue. This is probably an opportunity if you already have a law that looks good. Uh, has there been examples uh, where you were successful at actually challenging governments to proper implementation where they were actually ignoring what the, their laws? Well, we're in the process of rolling out those, those uh, different rules and, and uh, what we are seeing is that um, governments uh, do identify the company that are part of the and realize that there is a different uh, definition of what is good and what is not good to the country. We were not able, I don't have a single example yet, where we used our uh, lever to, to have things change in country. Uh, the only things we are saying that the, the demands in the country where we are, in terms of doing things that we don't want to do, are not as sharp or as big as they were two years ago during the revolutions. So, no, no, for that remains. Tim, yeah. The question from the audience. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm Tim Carr with Free Press. Um, are any um, in the Verizon's uh, court case? We submitted a brief that Verizon has the First Amendment right to act like a, a newspaper, a newspaper editor to decide what sort of content flows over the network and what sort of content does not. Um, now that that case, Verizon versus FCC, has been settled, are there any plans for Verizon to move in that direction, to become the editor-in-chief of the internet? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we didn't win, but that, that issue was not resolved by the courts. No. Uh, and but you did argue. One of our several arguments which, by the way, is if you read the cases upon which it's based, is a long-standing and well-established uh, right of, uh, of, of, of folks with networks to have uh, control over those networks. Um, so if you ask, do we have intentions to start acting like a newspaper and, and exert editorial control, I think the right thing to do is to look at our uh, principles that we have put out on our website, which very clearly state our our principles about uh, freedom of folks to go to uh, whatever website they like uh, and the like. Our 
assertion of our First Amendment right uh, was as a shield to what we regarded as an overreach by the FCC, inconsistent with what we thought its congressional limitations on its on its jurisdiction were, uh, not as a sword to try to uh, to push others uh, to to say we were going to uh, start exerting editorial control over the internet, which I think is a is a, a fool's errand uh, in any event. So I think that it's important to to recognize that uh, we had a fundamental disagreement over the what we perceive to be the jurisdiction of the, of the FCC uh, and raise that argument as a defensive shield that um, as a network operator with the FCC could not without more seek to exert the control it did uh, in contravention of our First Amendment rights. So, so the content of the brief itself runs counter to your own statements on, on the treatment of the open internet. So does that mean that you're you're distancing yourself from the claim that you do have the First Amendment right to act as the editor to the internet, or that you that they both have equal merit. Uh, I guess I'm not sure what you mean about my statements contravening something in the brief. So if you want to sit down with me later and go through it, I'd be happy to do that. All right. John. Hi, I'm John Fox with Access. Um, thank you for submitting yourself to this panel. Uh, I think <laughs> other eyes please did not show the. Uh, important to you to do that. Um, so first of all, just to clarify, in fact, some factual uh, items, um, you mentioned that ISPs progressively are dragged into this because they have to follow um, local laws and jurisdictions. Uh, here in the US, so at least according to recent reports, um, ISPs are very well compensated to the tune of $300 million by US taxpayers for the privilege of submitting our private records to uh, dubiously legal request from our government. So it's not that we being dragged, um, to clarify that. You mentioned the business model that we don't have an interest to block services to our consumers. Um, if a Verizon consumer tries to use Google Wallet, uh, he encounters exactly what you described. So obviously there is a business interest to block competing services. Um, and, 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 that, and that exists. You may not do it, you may not agree with it, but there is an interest, we can't deny that. And we've seen other companies, um, both on the wireless and wired internet doing that. Um, but I'm a little bit confused, and, trying, I'm, and the question is, I'm a little bit confused trying to square different statements um, in reaction to the FCC ruling, uh, the Vice President of Verizon said that it won't change how internet users experience the internet today. Today, we don't have a tiered internet. Today, we don't have uh, a paid for priority model. Verizon, in this court ruling, said that were it not for the 2010 rules, um, they would be doing this. And so that is definitely a change from today. So I'm trying to understand how, during the court ruling, they said that the open internet rules block them from exploring business models that you mentioned, which is different from what we experience today. So. Either the internet will change or it won't change, so it could help clarify that point. Where Verizon is looking at taking these models. Nice question, thank you for getting to it. Um, the, um, I think that, uh, first of all, let me just comment on the Google Wallet issue, which I think is a, I respectfully disagree with you on, on, on that, uh, on your analysis of what's going on there. Um, Verizon developed a secure element uh, it's got nothing to do with internet access, it's got nothing to do with anything else. We invested capital in investing in the secure element, and uh, it, it Google, what Google Wallet wanted to do, despite our agreement with Google, was access a proprietary piece of physical hardware. Nothing to do with software, nothing to do with anything else. And we demurred on allowing them, without remuneration, to access a piece of physical hardware that we developed. Um, I think that uh, when I said that, I think you were actually quoting me, um, I think I was the one who put out a blog post after the ruling that said that uh, the internet, the way what, what people do today is not going to change, clearly in reference to their ability to go anywhere and do what they wanted on the internet, which I think is a commitment we have made and we don't intend to, uh, to retreat from. Uh, I think that if you ask me, if you, when you made the statement that either the internet will change or won't change, obviously the internet's going to change, it changes every day. It's, what a very dynamic aspect, very dynamic part of all of our lives, uh, and to 
uh, suggest that it don't, won't change. Of course it will change. What I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do, is allow it to change, and we'll all see where it takes us on this. When you say we don't have a tiered internet today, well, I, I guess I would respectfully disagree in the sense that the internet, the internet is anything but neutral today. Net neutrality is beautiful terminology. It doesn't apply to the internet as we know it. It certainly doesn't apply to content delivery. It doesn't apply to many aspects of the internet. Content, uh, content developers today uh, pay large sums of money to cash data all over the, the country in the, in the United States in order to make sure that their content gets there faster than other content that is those content providers don't have the wherewithal to cash around the country. So the, it, it depends on how much they can afford on bandwidth in the middle mile. It depends on how much they can afford uh, all over the place. It depends how much that an end user can afford to pay uh, for internet access. So the, the notion of, a, of this, arc, this Arcadia where every bit is equal uh, and every bit is great uh, doesn't, in my mind, actually exist today. So I think that experimentation along these lines is valuable. I think that customers will vote with their feet. I think that the regulator is now sitting back there waiting to exert the jurisdiction that the court said it does have to make, to be sure that, uh, in their view, customers and competition aren't harmed. Uh, and I think that we're probably, in my view, we're in a better place seeing what, what, uh, what, what fertile minds can come up with to, uh, to see whether there's a better way of, uh, there's an interesting aspect or a different business model that will incite, excite um, some customers. Feet? Yeah. Um, you can't see them because they're behind you, but they've got a couple of back over here, too. Oh, yeah. All right. How about? Um, yeah, just, just following up on. I follow up. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Good. Topic, so. Just quickly. I'm not going to argue. Uh, thanks for getting around <laughs> to that response. Um, so I, I just wanted to just follow up on a couple of things. Um, Google Wallet exists on other phones that on other networks, and those networks are fine with it. What's different about Verizon's network? What is the same? I'd like to follow that up with just a question about uh, your internal security practices in general and how those might have changed in the past nine months or so. Um, you know, whether you've taken another look at your encryption practices, um, how much data you collect, how you store it, where you store it, and uh, you know, just a little bit broader questions on uh, data security practices. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to deal with both of those. Marcy, don't you want to answer this, this question? Um, the, um, uh, the issue with Google Wallet, again, is access to the secure element, not about anyone downloading Google Wallet onto a phone. They can do that. So if a phone doesn't have a secure element in it, or a phone does have a secure element in it, Google Wallet can be downloaded on Verizon network phones. It's not an issue. It was the only issue there was, was access to the secure element. So that's the only question that ever, was, ever arose about Google Wallet. Um, on, on internal security practices, we have uh, for a while uh, attempted to ensure that the retention of customer data was as minimal as possible. Um, in other words, we had um, adopted um, privacy by design principles some time ago to try to ensure that as we rolled out products and, and reviewed old products, we did not have data longer than it was that was necessary, either because of um, the longest we keep data is obviously for billing purposes that we have to have data to if we have a billing dispute with the customer. Um, other than that, um, we don't keep data um, very long at all. We try to keep it as minimal as possible, and it varies depending on the data. So I can't get into the can't off the top of my head list off all the different all the different time frames. Um, uh, have we reviewed our security practices? Honestly, we reviewed our security practices more because of the repeated denial of service attacks that you see across the, uh, across the various industries and, and the like. We've been very conscious uh, of ensuring that we are as tightly sealed as possible from, from all those uh, 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 issues that come up. Um, we do the best we can on a, on a continual basis to uh, try to stay, I would hesitate to say ahead because I'm not sure anyone's ahead, but even, uh, or as close to even as we can be. 
uh, on that front. Um, nothing about um, the, to me, nothing about the Snowden revelations as the Snowden revelations is that if that's what you were anchoring your nine months on, uh, increased concern about uh, the uh, security of our networks. Obviously, those revelations dealt with requests by governments and whether those requests by governments were appropriate or any, inappropriate. Well, it wasn't possible. just requests. It was also, some, in some cases, direct access. So There's no direct access from any Verizon, uh, or anything in Verizon that's not, that was not an issue for us. And so if there are direct access issues, there are others people's issues. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that I think that we continually try to make sure that we have as little much little as data as possible and it's as safe as possible. That's something that we continue to do repeatedly. Just to, 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 uh, to I think, John's uh, from Access. It's a little different model in developing countries. It's typically governments will uh, make the telecom uh, providers pay for the infrastructure and the cost of monitoring or interception or you know any of these. So it's not something that uh, telecom uh, providers in, in in most I would say African markets, uh, Asian markets would 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 do uh, willingly because. You're, you're typically then asked to fund um, uh, government uh, infrastructure uh, that is then used to essentially inhibit your customers and, and users. So the interests are quite uh, are, are, are not the same. So the government will ask the telecom providers to fund uh, you know all the equipment and the infrastructure for uh, you know uh, lawful. Uh, intercept and monitoring and, and so on, while it's totally controlled by government employees and government agents and so on. So the interests are, are I wish uh, the providers were paid by, by governments. Yeah, so I hear a little bit about um, differences between uh, global south top codes and uh, some of the others. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the industry dialogues, uh, you know, discussions with some of the, the Global South telcos? I know a South African telco uh, had some discussions about joining the industry dialogue and, and chose not to, um, you know, to the extent you can. What, what are their concerns and, and how do they perceive your group and your principles as dealing with their interests or, or not? Um, can you speak to them? Thanks. Um, our different goal is to extend the scope of the industry dialogue. We're completely open to newcomers. And the last one I came on board was at and uh, It took quite a while, but I got on board. Um, it is a completely open situation. Uh, we are talking to quite a few different operators in the world. Uh, we do uh, address some invitations just to go and come to our meetings. We, we, we have quite a, a lot of uh, work being done together. It's, it's a once a week meeting. So and yeah. we do exchange um, quite a lot of views on all, all the things that were you know, uh, discussed in this conference. We're talking about transparency. We're talking about trying to develop our, our principle in the country. How do they apply to the country? Um, what do we do in terms of Education in terms of uh, trying to comply with uh, with uh, trying to, to to have alerts when it happens in some country and things like that. Uh, for the moment, uh, we, we we do have two uh, industries and seven telcos. Yeah. Uh, we we have about two telcos in a row to join. They're not the only nation that means that it's not yet. And we have one uh, industry to, to, to come to join. Definitely, uh, the more will be the best leverage we we'll have towards government, and one of the answers I couldn't give uh, just before is uh, we will be able to influence the different uh, countries and different uh, governments 
if we're strong, if we can advocate for a transparency, maybe not during, because we're constrained with our regulation, but maybe after. It was, it was uh, very much uh, a strong demand to, to do transparency after it, uh, when things are happening to that. Uh, so that could be a way to prevent uh, government to, to ask uh, all those things. So that's where we are. Uh, we, we, we do not uh, make a, a selection of who we do want and we, who we don't want within the audience to be wide open. And we do believe that the best practice sharing we're doing on the every week basis yeah. will bring uh, the whole. Subject. And you bring outside stakeholders into that process? Okay, so as you, as you, you, you know, but maybe not. Audience doesn't know, we've decided to, to sit the idea on the GNI platform. Uh, doing so, we do have open our discussion with GNI members, all of them, and we do also have our own uh, stakeholder outreach where we do meet uh, and, uh, many, many NGOs, many, many activists, many, many government, people, many other telcos, and, and try to explain what we're doing. So, yeah. Just, just uh, to tell you, we are also meeting every three months physically. We will be in Washington in April, and we, we have scheduled quite a few meetings there. Peter? Yeah. I believe it was him. Yeah. And then him. Perfect. Uh, I'm Yvette Christian, I'm David Salejo. I have a question for Eve and Larry, which is, what's the role of the equipment manufacturers in the industry, in the telco industry dialogue, as opposed to the telecom? So NSN and Alcatel Lucent are in there. Um, what's the role, and do you foresee other equipment manufacturers coming in, in the future? As I said, we're completely open and we share uh, the responsibility with suppliers. Uh, basically, the role is about the same. When a government wants to have access to an equipment, let me say first to everybody that we do have the technology. Both suppliers and telcos uh, are using equipment that are used for quality management in our network, but they could be used for other purposes like surveillance. Um, the, the makers of those equipment are the equipment makers, so we have had uh, stars, and, and just to, to mention Iran with uh, Siemens a few years ago, where the demand of the government is exactly the same on suppliers and then what is in, in for telcos. And I was trying to explain to, to a learning forum we had a few months ago to everybody that uh, we just addressed a specific equipment, which was the packet inspection platform, which we just regulate the flux into different uh, telco channels. Uh, we do put them on the ground all the time. We need them for, as I say, a quality regulation of our network. So the question that we were asked was, uh, did you put for the government DPI? And which is not the right question. We do put DPI to, to do uh, networking, quality networking. The right, the right question is, do you train government people to use uh, this kind of equipment? And in that case, the answer for us is a lot uh, easier to do. If, uh, the answer would be no for, for the people around the industry. Yeah. Okay. Right there. I have a quick comment and a question for Pam. Um, my name is Mahid Razavi with Biz Cloud and Ethics and Tech. One comment that was made is that we actually have a choice in telecommunication providers. We can get up and leave and go somewhere else. In the Bay Area in San Francisco, there's two providers that we're bringing bandwidth through our house. One is AT&T, the other one is Comcast. Comcast just acquired Time Warner Cable, so our choice is becoming less and less when it comes to providers in the States. This, the question that I had is we're a mile away from Room 641A uh, of AT&T here, where Mark Klein disclosed a bulk collection of everything that went across the wire at AT&T in that room uh, in 2002. And what I'm curious on is, what are the plans from a European perspective uh, to avoid passing traffic to the Bay West and May East and U.S. transit points, considering companies in the U.S. Uh, in the telco sector are doing bulk collection of those records on behalf of NSA? Well, there is a convention in between Europe and, and, and the States which is safe harbor for, for data collection in both directions. We are just discovering 
of those uh, facilities are not as secure as uh, we thought they could be. So we are, uh, Europe is, is discussing with the states nowadays to try to redefine security that was uh, safe harbor. It's one thing. And, and the second thing is, as I said uh, just on my previous answer, to get onto our networks, uh, if you have the uh, knowledge and the equipment, you can do it without even asking telcos to do so. We had the very recent affair with NSA spying on one of our cable, submarine cable. Uh, we didn't know it. It was far away from any of our equipment. We couldn't listen to that. It, it usually is a small noise that's been on the, on the, on the network, but uh, it's difficult to say if it's someone's mind. So what we did is that uh, Orange in France just uh, filed, filed an action against the statement, uh, and we're really following on them. So we're facing the difficulties, basically, and trying to react to it. Um, I think we're uh, going to get to our final statements here. Um, you know, one of the main focuses of RightsCon is to produce real outcomes on, on human rights. and. Uh, I'd like to hear from uh, each of our panelists, including uh, uh, the writer and activists, so about uh, what you plan to do in the next year to, uh, to improve your and your company's uh, impacts on human rights. I think anything I say is just going to be a wish list, because the four um, the, the, the four uh, uh, telecom providers in, in my country are not sitting here. They are not part of the uh, industry dialogue. Um, so if I do have something concrete to say, is that how would all of you in your industry dialogue make it more attractive for them to join that so they will be influenced by, by this thinking? Um, and that's my most concrete request, actually, because all of them, one is South African, uh, one is Kuwaiti, uh, one is Emirati, uh, and the other is the, uh, 20 or 22 percent owned by the government. I, listening and hearing well, the discussion, it kind of it reminded it reminded me of um, two years ago in 2012 when uh, Azerbaijan was hosting the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, the whole idea of Azerbaijan holding the Internet Governance Forum was in itself quite interesting, but the experience. Um, Right at the venue where the IGF was, was organized, next door was um, telecoms, a uh, big, big telecoms exhibition uh, conference. And the way our government showed how much importance it attaches to an international UN sponsored event versus a telecom event was by President actually making an appearance at the telecoms, not IGF, and sending his. Um, uh, someone from the party actually to make a, you know, his, to read out his letter uh, at the opening of the IGF. Um, and this is, it kind of brings me back to something that I said in the beginning, was that as a China government, you know, it cares a lot more about the telecoms because, you know, it uses telecoms to see what people are, activists and, and journalists and advocates are up to, uh, because it has clear control to what's out there. You know, they have a clear channel between the telecom companies uh, to actually track down users, uh, and it's not it's not secret. Everybody in Azerbaijan, at least those who follow uh, these kind of news, know that the Secret Service, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, doesn't even have to ask for permission. They can just put in whatever number that they want to, you know, start tracking, and they can just do it easily. And there's no body that can actually prevent the Ministry of Internal Affairs from doing that. Um, and personally, in, in in my role as as Dalia. As, my idea with that I mentioned, you know, it's what I would like our telecoms to do is a wish list, is, is a wish. Um, luckily, there is a representative from Telesonera who does have contacts with SRSL, one of the leading companies, and I did hear yesterday that there are steps towards tackling some of the problems, it just takes time. My only wish and my only concern is that this time, it doesn't take very long time, but it was, you know, the meetings and, and, and trying to convince the Chinese government from stop spying on its people and stop using the information against them and stop putting them in jail because of a text message that they sent, um, covering the protest or saying something about the president, uh, is very important to me, and I'd really like this to, to, to happen very, very soon and not, you know, wait for I don't know how many years for it to happen. So, yeah. Can I ask something? Oh. 
It's also the diligence of US-based companies. For instance, Sudan is a sanctioned country, and yet US surveillance uh, equipment manages to land in Sudan. Um, uh, recently, Citizen Lab did a, a research where they found um, a California-based company, actually. Um, I think it's called Blue Coat. Uh, and, and they managed to trace three of its, uh, in, in three computers, including in Canartel, uh, the existence of this its surveillance uh, software. Um, and of course, these companies always come out and, and say, we were not aware uh, that in repressive regimes, uh, our, um, our um, software has been used. Uh, so I think there is also some kind of due diligence uh, from the you know uh, surveillance companies based in, in the West generally when it comes to um, uh, being more responsible when its equipment ends up in in, in the repressive regime and Blue Coat is not the only example. There's another Italian company also recently that had yeah. So uh, uh, that's probably not a wish directly linked to the telecoms, but generally to to to, to, to the uh, you know industries based in the northern hemisphere. Um, you know, in mind, it's better to make a, a sustained uh, contribution as a company on the sort of the, the issues around um, this year on internet governance, particularly as we move to uh, Brazil and uh, Thailand uh, and beyond. And the obviously complex, complex it is in two ways there. Um, but one of them is the sort of the, the, sort of the plethora of fora. Uh, there are lots and lots of places to talk about the same thing. Uh, and also lots and lots of principles about substantially the same thing. So, if, if, so therefore, you know, rationally and logically, there ought to be a way of uh, bringing that together. So we, we'd like to try and, try and sort of um, uh, help with that uh, as far as we're able. I think uh, initiatives like the industry dialogue uh, helps strengthen the hands of, of uh, telecom operators uh, in their uh, ongoing uh, discussion with this governance. Um, the, the larger uh, coalitions uh, that put uh, generally accepted principles that uh, go across uh, different geographies, I think would make it um, easier for telecom uh, operators in, uh, from markets with looser regulations to, to push for what is uh, global norms and global standards. Um, you know, at the end, it's going to be, unfortunately, the debate between telecom operators and governments is not an equal um, discussion in loosely regulated markets. Um, in, in more freer societies where you have access to courts and so on, that, that, that could be a, a much easier uh, discussion, but in looser regulated, so you need as much um, of uh, operators working together to have uh, the weight and the size to be able to have a more equal discussion with governments. Okay, of course, as, as um as practice sharing and, and led by the example uh, um, on behalf of the idea, I'd like to, to construct a, a secure process between governments and us so that we could at least come back to the process and decide if yes or no the demand is, is respecting this, this process. If we do that, we would be probably able to make a huge step forward in terms of us.
to, to, to try to be a force for good in this. And so I think that it's an important job. And it's incumbent on U.S. telco providers to assist in that. So that's, I think, going to be a focus. Well, please thank the panel.